So now moving on to early classical sociological theory. Auguste Comte, a French philosopher, is widely known as the father of sociology and coined the term sociology to describe his scientific approach to the study of society, seeing the field as a branch of the natural sciences or a type of social physics. Again, looking back to what we discussed in week one, this is referring to how Comte initially saw sociology as a queen of the sciences or a kind of social physics that studies how individuals carry themselves in the social world, not unlike the way physics would study atoms and molecules. And as also discussed earlier, the reason for them considering sociology as a branch of the natural sciences was a result of the theories of the Enlightenment and their belief that society could move forward in a positivist sense. So Comte believed that society progressed through three stages, theological, metaphysical and positive. According to Comte, the positive or scientific stage, during which the natural laws governing social phenomena would be uncovered, could and would restore order to society. That is the reason why the early sociologists wished to discover general laws. This may also be impacted by the fact that Auguste Comte was, of course, living in the era uh, that was directly after the French Revolution, where France was experiencing the social protest, unrest and disorder caused by the destruction of the ancient regime or the monarchy system in Europe, whereby the aristocrats held most of the power and resources and the peasants and the middle classes wanted a revolution to redistribute the wealth equally. To get a better picture of this whole scenario, you can watch or read Les Miserables. Next, moving on, we have Herbert Spencer, an English sociologist and philosopher, who believed that societies moved from simple to complex stages, and who developed the analogy of society as an organism, or like an independent functioning living thing like a human body that is made up of various organs and parts that need to function together, need to work together to survive. So according to Spencer, society, like an organism, represents a system with structures and functions, as well as a certain level of evolutionary advancement based on its structural form. So it's like how you have simple life forms, single cell life forms like amoebas, and you contrast that with an entire human body, much, much more complex. So Spencer, um, in a way also classified as a structural functionalist, believed that social structures function to meet the needs of society. So all social institutions exist because they fulfill a particular function that is necessary for the entire society to survive. Just like a human body has a certain number of organs and body parts that are all functional. We don't really have any extra body parts, like a tail, for example, that is not functional to the survival of our bodies. So in the structural functionalist paradigm, Spencer and the rest of the sociologists believe that Society only has a limited number of social institutions and these are justified by its functions that are crucial to the survival of society. Next on, we have Georg Simmel, a German sociologist who was concerned with social structure and sociability and who researched and wrote extensively about the nature of association, culture, social structure, the city and the economy. And Simmel's work was also a major influence on Durkheim and Weber, two very important theorists that we'll be seeing a lot throughout this course, as well as 19th century European intellectual life as a whole. Of particular relevance to the 19th century was Simmel's work on the metropolis, its how cities expand over time, which reflected the period's urbanizing landscape. So finally, we come to three of the main major sociological theorists that we're going to see a lot of in the rest of this course. We'll start with Karl Marx, perhaps the most prominent sociologist, philosopher and e economist, a German, and who was one of the first scholars to identify society as a system of social relationships and economics, capitalism and production. And these are all seen as major social forces. 
So Marx believed that the history of human society was primarily shaped by economic conflict between owners of the means of production and the workers or labourers who are selling their labour to work for the owners. So he is obviously taking a very conflict-based perspective, as in the form of people who own the resources versus those who do not own the resources. And so Marx argued that the emerging system of capitalism was creating societies in which the increased value of the material world devalued people and society. It's like we can all put a price on someone's head based on how good a worker they are and not other kinds of intrinsic value as a human being. So Marx also studied the processes of worker alienation and objectification. That's where we have the concept of humans as a resource, like human resources, and develop a theory of worker alienation, which argued that workers experience a lack of control and self-realization in the labor process. So ontology-wise, Marx had several assumptions here. We're going to cover some of the main ones, like labor theory of value, alienation, and uh, the other relevant ones uh, in which he talk about capitalism. So generally, Marx distrusted the system known as capitalism because, as mentioned earlier, uh, it was all based on the concept of profit, which is how much extra value you can get out of selling something that you produce with your own hands. So this could be used to underpay and overwork people, and your labour becomes a commodity. So Marx is very much contrasting the way in which modern-day post-industrial revolution workers had to sell themselves or sell their potential for labour by working for an owner of the means of production, uh, in other words, like a factory owner, where it's different from the past during the feudal society era in Europe, in which uh, aristocrats usually had a lot of land and um, they employed peasants to work for them for a lifetime. And they weren't counted based on um, how many units of product X they could produce. Although, of course, it's hard to say whether there was any exploitation. But it wasn't based on a fixed salary. And you also had the, the concept of uh, craftsmanship, whereby you had people like blacksmiths or even other kinds of skilled workers who were their own bosses and who could actually decide uh, based on their own expertise, how to make something, how to make a sword, how to make a weapon, an axe. And this was not limited by the demands of a factory or the owners of production. So in conjunction with that, you have the concept of alienation. Nothing to do with aliens from outer space, of course. But this is rather where a person becomes detached from the product of their labour, uh, in which workers are forced to sell their labour time to capitalists. So in contrast to the craftsmanship definition earlier on, where a person could decide how much time and effort they want to put into making a product, you now have to sell yourself as though you were a commodity to the owners of means of production, who would then put a price uh, in which your wages would be determined based on how many products of unit X you could make in a single day. And therefore you're alienated because you can't control how things are going to work. So that's why it's called alienation, because you are distanced from the ability to make decisions with regards to your own labour. So alienation has four basic components. The first is that workers are alienated from their productive activity. Number two, workers are alienated from the objects of those activities or the finished products. Number three, they are alienated from their fellow workers. And number four, they are alienated from their own human potential. This means that, in other words, workers really can't make any decisions regarding how work is to be done, and they're not even allowed to unionize in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. So for Marx, his ontology, in short, is that the world is unstable, and that the only thing constant is that there is social change. Social change has a pattern, it is not random, and it is the task of the sociologists to uncover this pattern. This therefore puts him under the sociological perspective of conflict theory, because he was largely concerned about social inequality that is created by conflict between social classes. Social class in turn is defined by the individual's relation to the means of production. In other words, you are either an owner of the means of production, or you are a worker who has to sell yourself and your labour to the owner of the means of production. If you're an owner of the means of production, 
you're a bourgeois, and if you're a worker, you're a member of the proletariat. And so this puts him under the epistemology of realism, because Marx believed that the scientific method could be used for research. But, as mentioned in week one, realists try to construct theories first, and then conduct observations later, to either prove or disprove these theories. And he also believed in exploring the hidden reality and studying the underlying causal mechanisms. Followers of Marx, what we call Marxists, or those who embrace a Marxian perspective, interpreted Marx's ideas in two different ways. Half of his followers interpreted Marx as a scientific person. So this was the school of thought known as scientific Marxism. They believed that Marx ultimately considered the economic base to be the sole determinant for the nature of social class relations. So this bunch of followers believed that Marx was similar to a positivist and believed to some extent in economic determinism, as we mentioned earlier in the lecture in week one. But the other half of Marx's followers didn't think so. They interpreted him as a humanist, so they were called humanist Marxists. And they in turn took a more interpretivist point of view, where they didn't believe that Marx believed in economic determinism. They acknowledged that he merely included the economic base as one major component, among many other factors, that led society towards creating social class relations. Marx, of course, was not without his critics. Now, he predicted that because of its inherent problems of exploitation between the bourgeois and proletariat, capitalism would meet its own demise. But yet, that did not happen. And in fact, capitalism is here to stay. And it has changed and evolved over the years. So his prediction that socialism would replace capitalism as a major economic system in the world failed to happen. Originally, Marx believed that capitalism inherently exploited workers, and so workers would develop something called class consciousness, in which they become or they transform from a class of individuals in themselves to a class for themselves. Because when they realize that they are being exploited, what he predicted was that they would rise up and try to overthrow the system. So there would then be revolution, and then there would be social change. Now, if we go back to epistemology, this doesn't necessarily mean that Marx's theories were not useful at all. Rather, if we look at how science progresses through refutation, then we are in fact able to refine Marx's predictions to highlight the problems inherent within capitalism and how they can be improved. So now we come to Emile Durkheim, who was a protégé of Comte. He was also a French sociologist who was concerned with the problem of the relationship between the individual and society. In other words, how do we as individuals fit into the wider society and therefore into the social order, as well as issues of solidarity and social cohesion. So very much a functionalist and also a positivist, seeing society as composed of various small parts that make up the larger picture and has to work in harmony with each other. So according to Durkheim, it is people's social roles or functions that is the glue that holds society together. He developed the theories of organic solidarity, which is the bonding of a population of people through their employment, labor, and social roles, in contrast to another concept called mechanical solidarity, where people bond, usually in a small group, around similar interests, values, and beliefs. Mechanical solidarity is the kind of solidarity we usually see in perhaps a small village, for example, a village of fishermen or farmers, where everyone more or less does the same occupation. Fishing, for example, everyone goes out to sea. They have the same values and beliefs regarding um, the climate, regarding what are some safe practices, the same superstitions, and the same goals. So because of that, People in villages who have mechanical solidarity tend to be very close-knit or tight-knit and tend to reject outside influences. Now, in contrast to that, we have organic solidarity, which is a new kind of solidarity that emerged in Europe, particularly during the Industrial Revolution, whereby there was a large wave of migration 
away from small villages and small towns into the larger cities in search of work in factories, as Marx talked about when he talked about selling your labour to the owners of the means of production. So this led towards new moral consciousness or new collective consciousness uh, formed around new arrangements of labour. So in organic solidarity, it's a little more differentiated in terms of the division of labour because in a big city, you have people who specialise in different types of employment. You won't find everyone working as a farmer or a fisherman. Uh, you'll find different kinds of people from uh, those working as labourers uh, to those working as uh, professionals. You have clerical staff, you have perhaps medical staff, you have... Um, people in sales, you have people who are like lawyers, and then you have the owners of means of production. And they all depend on each other for survival in the larger picture. Nobody is an island. Nobody can become a labourer, a factory owner, and also a healthcare worker at the same time, for example. So in short, both types of solidarity, organic and mechanical, according to Durkheim, promote social cohesion and collective conscience. Next up, we have Max Weber, who was a German politician, historian, economist, and sociologist, and who was very much inspired by the theories of Marx himself, and in fact, developed many of his ideas in relation to what Marx said. So Weber dedicated a large part of his work to the study of religion, sociology of religion, and is also considered one of the key founders of sociology, besides the and Marx. Weber, a leader in social theory, was a proponent of the interpretivist method of sociological study, as we covered in week one, which entails studying the meanings people attach to their social environments and daily lives to find out the meanings behind social action. Out of concern for the problem of meaning, Weber worked to understand how actors, actors in this sense mean social actors, everyone who plays a social role in society, how individuals in society created meaning for themselves and others. In addition to his work on authority and power in organisations, Weber also made significant contributions to the field of rural sociology. So what are some of Weber's key assumptions or ontology? We're going to cover several, like ideal types, um, his idea of being value-free, his idea of meaningful social action, his elaboration and extension of Marx's concept of social class to go beyond class into that of status and party, and his ideas on power through domination, and also his concept of rationalization. So first of all, we have ideal types. Ideal types, for Weber, were conceptual tools created by a social scientist to sort of become a benchmark to measure various social phenomena. It functions to capture the essential features of certain social phenomena and is also known as a heuristic device or a measurement device. For example, when studying the origins of capitalism in the West, uh, Weber contrasted this to the possibility of capitalism developing in the East, in China in particular, and he contrasted the different social institutions and values and beliefs that existed in the West and in China. And Using this ideal type, Weber was able to sort of develop a checklist to see which features were available in the West and which features were available in China or not available. And that led towards the West overtaking the East in terms of modern day capitalism. So ideal types must be logically constructed concepts and have to be derived from the real world of social history. In other words, you can only create a benchmark for social phenomenon based on actual phenomenon that can exist in the human world. So this ideal type cannot be overly abstract. It has to be empirically adequate or something that's measurable. Must be neither too general nor too specific. And ideal types too can evolve over time because there are after all checklists or benchmarks. Uh, just like where science progresses through refutation, ideal types can also be developed anew or rather typologies of things can be developed uh, and be refreshed to fit the changing reality. And they're not fixed in time. So his next ontology was that of having values when doing research. 
So Weber believed that no research is completely value-free. But what he meant here is not about bringing one's values into the picture and telling others what to do. It's rather about having a certain preference to research certain topics. So for Weber, social scientists must not let their personal values influence their scientific research in any way. For example, if we were to study drug addicts and the reason why they start taking drugs, we mustn't bring in our value judgments upon them to say whether this is bad or good. We should approach it objectively. But the reason why you may have chosen this topic in the first place may be because you have a certain disposition towards certain types of topics. So the question then was, could academics eliminate all their values entirely from their research? Weber believed that fact could be separated from value, objectively. But he acknowledged that values can be used only in certain aspects of the research process, excluding data collection. So he still advocated that we should basically use accurate observation and systematic comparison. Values are only relevant at the start of the research project when selecting a topic of interest. So this is called value relevance. For example, in Weber's own case, he tried to look at why capitalism emerged in the West rather than the East, and he looked uh, at it in terms of the Protestant ethic in the West, in Europe, uh, in terms of religion, because he himself was from, he was German, so he was from Europe, and throughout his life he was very much concerned with the differences between uh, Catholicism and Protestantism. So Weber also chose to study bureaucracy because it was a new phenomenon growing in Europe during his lifetime. Moving on, we also look at meaningful social action which form the basis or unit of analysis of Weber's sociology. So Weber differentiated between action and purely reactive behavior in the sense that humans are capable of performing actions that may be just a reaction, for example, sneezing or coughing or clearing their throat. Now, in clearing one's throat, it could be something that's totally biological because you've choked on something. Or, for example, to take a, a, an amusing one, uh, when people play mahjong, for example, and they want to signal to their um, friend about another person's... Um, mahjong tiles, they might be clearing their throat to give them a signal. So in this case, clearing one's throat could become something that's just reactive or something that has a social meaning. So what the sociologists would be interested in looking at would be meaningful social actions, that is, actions that carry social significance and not actions like uh, coughing because something is stuck in one's throat. That may be for the medical scientists. Therefore, Weber was concerned with action that clearly involved the intervention of thought processes. That means some thought has gone into why you perform this symbolic action. And so this results in meaningful action, of which there are four types. Number one, instrumentally rational. That means it's a calculated move towards getting something that you want. Value rational which means you're doing something based on your beliefs and your values and principles. Number three, traditional. For example, going through an arranged marriage because the parents or the elders say so. And number four, effectual. We do something out of affection because we're caring. So Weber also refined Marx's ideas of the way power is stratified. While Marx looked at one main uh, dimension of power in which people are separated based on their relations to the economic means of production, which results in social class, Weber extended this to also look at status and party. So in other words, Weber did not reduce social stratification to economic factors, but saw this as multidimensional. So for Weber, society is stratified or divided on the basis of economics, which is where social class comes into the picture, status, in which people might belong to different, um, for example, in the past in feudal society, you had aristocrats with titles 
and then you had people with no titles like peasants uh, or you come from a very um, famous or prestigious lineage and the final dimension which is power uh, in which people could belong to a large social movement or rather not at all. So for Weber, social class is also defined as a group of people whose shared situation is possible. In other words, like Marx's idea of a class uh, in itself, where people realize that they all belong to the same social class in terms of relation to means of production. And a class for itself is when they realize that they can fight for their rights within that social class. So this is often a basis for action by the group. A group which has the same economic or market situation is a class. And parties here are structures struggling for domination. So they include not only the state, but in a social club or movement. Talking about power, Weber also defined what happens when power is entrenched for a long period of time. So he was interested in what we call domination, uh, in which authority has taken place um, in a very established way, and it's become the norm for power to be concentrated in the hands of a few over the many. So Weber also identified three types of authority that was legitimate. Or authority is when someone's power has been acknowledged, and power is defined as one's ability to make someone else do their bidding, whether or not the other person agrees or disagrees in their heart. So there are three types of authority, rational authority, rational legal authority, where it's by the law, traditional authority, where again it's quite similar to traditional social action, where one follows the customs and traditions uh, of the uh, family or the group. And the third one being charismatic authority, which you often see in perhaps the most common example would be cults. But there is a very charismatic leader who has a force of personality and can motivate others to do what they want. So these are types of power which uh, over time can um, be accepted in the way that gives the leader authority. And when it has been entrenched for long enough, it's called a condition of domination. So in tandem with the process of rational legal authority, we also have a concept called rationalization, in which Weber was talking about the symptoms of the Industrial Revolution, where craftsmanship was totally overtaken by... Um, systematic ways of doing things, putting laws into place, which govern everything from labour to family relationships. So rationalization could be defined in two ways. One was means ends, uh, which means it's a very economic uh, way of uh, doing things, and value rationality, which is based on one's principles. It could be beliefs, it could be philosophy, it could be religion. So Weber used this term to describe the modern Western world in terms of capitalism, where everything becomes uh, calculated and boiled down to a few principles. And so he was also criticizing bureaucracy because bureaucracy became the established way of controlling labor. So it became to the point that Weber compared it to an iron cage of bureaucracy, where there are so many rules and regulations that it's like nobody can make individual decisions anymore. So Weber was concerned with the effect of formal rationalization of the economy and bureaucracies on the Western world because these structures emphasize calculability, efficiency, and predictability. And Weber was afraid that this would cause individual freedom to diminish. So we've looked at the ontology of Max Weber, and um, epistemology-wise, he's been described as an interpretivist. So now let's look at a general overview of how that influences methodology in the many, many works that he completed. So he linked sociology to history, and he, in fact, he de-emphasized methodology, where he looked at history as the source of his evidence to explain why capitalism arose in the West and not in China. So he also considered the link between history and science, where if you take a positivist viewpoint, you're looking at something very particular, uh, which we call uh, nomotatic. You're looking at norms. And, um, I mean, sorry, you mean you're looking at something very general in which you're looking at norms. That's positivism. And in contrast to that, if you were to look at a subjectivist point of view, that means you're looking at something very particular or ideographic. So positivists look at the nomothetic, 
side of things based on norms and subjectivists look at particular things which we call ideographic phenomenon that's very particular to history like the rise of capitalism but while considering these things Weber did not want to choose either positivism or subjectivism so he rejected both extremes and that's why he preferred ideal types instead and he used these ideal types to compare and contrast to empirical historical data but the critics say that Weber often got too deep in historical detail that he might have lost track of his objective Weber also advocated a form of methodology called Fechtian in which we try to understand the meanings behind other people's actions so that's where he tried to uh, incorporate this into his historical research which is also a method derived from hermeneutics or studying the meaning of texts of course there were also critics that say um, Fechtian here is too closely linked to intuition and therefore not objective so Weber clarified in turn that that's not what he meant, but Fechtian involved systematic and rigorous research. And he was actually also criticized for oscillating between individualist and subjectivist methodology sometimes, uh, whereby on the one hand, he looked at the meanings behind social action, which seemed to be a very individualistic perspective, but he was also interested in large-scale social structures like bureaucracy and capitalism. So it's interesting sometimes when you have such a influential theories like Weber, where a lot of his work influenced both the micro and macro levels of sociology. So to recap, it was Weber's work which also paved the way for the later schools of thought that we will cover, like symbolic interactionism and ethnomethodology. We'll continue with um, the critical theory and also uh, the American school of thought, in which we look at structural functionalism, and symbolic interactionism.